Welcome to today's Smart Mobility Connection seminar. My name is Joy Mann, and I am with the Mobility 21 University Transportation Center. The Mobility 21 Connection Smart Mobility Connection Series is sponsored by the Traffic 21 Institute and the Mobility 21 University Transportation Center as an opportunity for faculty to showcase their current transportation projects. It is also an opportunity for students, fellow faculty, deployment partners, and the broader community to engage and network with researchers, highlight opportunities for involvement, and foster future interdisciplinary collaboration. For those joining virtually, this session is being recorded and all participants' microphones are muted. To ask a question, please send a message through the chat box. You do not need to wait until the end of the presentation to send your questions. Now I would like to introduce today's speaker. Rahul Meng Karam is an associate professor in the Department of Electrical and Systems Engineering at the University of Pennsylvania. He is a founding member of the Precise Center and directs the Safe Autonomous Systems Lab at Penn. His research is at the intersection of formal methods, machine learning, and controls for medical devices, energy efficient buildings, and autonomous systems. Please help me welcome Professor Rahul Meng Mangaram as he tells us about his University Transportation Center project, Tiny Machine Learning. Thank, thank you for the introduction, uh, Joy. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm a former uh, I'm a CMU alum. I spent uh, over 10 years in CMU. Uh, so it's uh, really exciting to talk to everyone back in CMU. Uh, uh, yeah, so I can, uh, today I have a very exciting, uh, you know, for, uh, discussion to show you. And uh, uh, we have a, a very new and exciting course that we have been developing. And, and everything that we develop over here uh, is, uh, is is free and open source, and we want to share it with everyone. Could you just let me know if you see the screen or you see the uh, the notes also on the screen? We can just see the screen. Okay, that's that's great. Yeah, so 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 this is a very new course. It's very cutting edge, and uh, so I'm going to talk to you about our you know a, a journey to building tiny ml as a course and then and now this course is actually freely available to you everything is recorded everything is online uh, there are over 90 video snippets anywhere from 5 to 10 minutes that just focus on these topics and uh, the whole idea is that you don't need any background right you can just dive into building machine learning applications no matter what your interests are, right? So welcome to Tiny ML or Tiny Machine Learning. So this is a course like no other class that you've probably taken yet. And it's, you know, absolutely at the bleeding edge of technology and machine learning. So you've probably he heard about the buzz about machine learning and that's why you're here, right? So this is a very exciting course that first introduces you to the fundamentals of machine learning. And then here you develop applications to process, understand, images, speech, motion gestures, you know, all on battery operated hardware that costs less than a dollar. So this enables interactive and useful sensor-based systems to solve real world problems. So you can think of this as, you know, the first course in both machine learning and in embedded systems, and you don't need a background in either. So TinyML brings the AI into the internet of things to create modern applications at the edge of the internet. So such systems can be deployed in agricultural fields to monitor water, nutrition for better yield, can be deployed in forests to detect you know, forest fires early or deployed on you know, endangered animals to safeguard them. And of course, in our context from a transportation view, I'm gonna show you some cases where we will use them uh, because a lot of this machine learning is now has to happen right where the sensors are, right at the edge, right in the vehicle, not on the person. And so, but this can also be a basis of a next exciting startup, you know, something that, you know, you could do after this course. Um, so here's an example, like, you know, of a picture that you take in your smartphone. It's more likely that, you know, there's machine learning voodoo that's happening here to like sort of make this image crisper, more uh, have richer colors uh, than, the, than the image that comes out from your sensor to your screen. So it has been enhanced, but it's been enhanced right on the spot, right next to the sensor and at the moment of you taking that image. That, right. So there are many subclasses of machine learning. So take, for example, image classification, being able to tell whether the picture here has a cat or a dog, 
if there's a cat, you know, a bunch of pixels are being fed in and ultimately the machine learning network says, hey, it's a cat. Sometimes it might look at, you might look at the same exact picture and say, oh, actually it's a dog and it's incorrect. So such, you know, machine learning is stochastic in nature. They are always guaranteed to be correct. And, you know, a lot of our research is focused on how can we actually bound, you know, the risk Oh, and the uh, uncertainty in these machine learning algorithms, but I, I won't go on down that path, but we want, if we want to use it for safety critical, life critical applications like that, right? Then, you know, uh, take applications such as, you know, object detection, given an image, you know, a, a, an object detec detector can say, well, there's actually an orange versus an apple and also precisely locate them in the frame. And you can also do like instance level detection where you, for every orange that is there, you're able to detect and count the number of objects of each type. And then there's image segmentation, you know, which is heavily used in autonomous cars, where cars need to know exactly where is the drivable versus non-drivable surface. And um, there are other vehicles, you know, and human beings in the picture. So segmentation is a way of colorizing the entire image into different categories, you know, and uh, where all the pixels for a certain class are the same color. So for instance, in the purple color indicates the sidewalk that's all connected together. And that's a non-drivable surface that the car should avoid. And, and similarly, as we go into now, you know, future uh, advanced uh, driving safety systems where you want to detect the physical and psych physiological state of the driver, you want to do things beyond just object detection and manage the vehicle safety or take over control when the driver is not able to take over control and vice versa, right? Let, let the driver take over control when the autonomous agent is not able to. Then there's a huge amount of machine learning that is being used, you know, under the hood now for future vehicles, uh, for vision, for audio, for uh, uh, time series sensor data, like inertial measurement units to ensure the safety and uh, provide more convenience and comfort. So this course is really, you know, focused on how can we do all this processing right at the edge and what is involved. And so also, if you recall, like earlier, I was talking like, you know, there's machine translation, for example, in smart glasses, right? And you want to have contextual hearing, you want that to be executed right in real time. So you've got to take a whole bunch of different words and you've got to train the machine learning model. So think of this as like a machine learning black box. And you know now you have to be able to make predictions for a particular language. And then you have to do the lang natural language processing for it. This is another case where you want to do machine learning. But now this is where things really get interesting because we want to move all of this that's happening in data centers to smartphones. And the reason we want to move do that move is because there's a lot of interactivity when we are working uh, with these systems right at the edge. And there's a lot of interesting real-time behavioral patterns, you know, that we can exercise with machine learning, uh, but we can get even more when we make these devices completely pervasive, you know, in our lives. So we need to figure out like what processing should be done locally to maintain this responsiveness and what processing should be shipped to the data center for more complex inference. And if we want all these devices to be intelligent, because then there's a lot of information that they can sense and gather, you know, so that they can help us. Certainly, we have to be careful about that. And, you know, through this course, we also talk about the risks and the ethics of, you know, machine learning uh, to that, right? So, so we want to have like low bandwidth, low latency and low power, along with fast responsiveness, high accuracy for processing image, speech or other sensor data. So everyday objects such as smartwatches, even the electronic toothbrushes, you know, and thermostats, wireless earphones, uh, parking meters, they have elements of machine learning and then by stream processing, you know, on device to provide real time inference. And that's what's in tiny machine learning today. And that's why people are so excited about tiny machine learning happening on all these embedded devices, you know, where now more complex machine learning can move this you know, capability from big computational clouds you know, to you and I and have a really rich experience with our devices and so that they can respond and interact with us in real time. Uh, so tiny machine learning or tiny ML as we call it is an emerging field that's at the intersection of machine learning and embedded systems. And an embedded system is a computing device that is usually small, 
uh, like the one that you know it, that we're holding in this hand over here, and operates on very low power, extremely low power, uh, so much so that you know some of these devices can run for weeks or months, you know, even years on a button cell. And this tiny ML is, you know, it's all about taking, you know, just a small little computing device, you know, like these, you know, sub $1 microcontrollers and being able to shrink this machine learning, you know, and bring all the smarts so that it can just run locally, right? But, you know, now everyone has a different understanding, you know, of what is machine learning. Maybe you've taken the courses, maybe you're new to it, but I'll start from the scratch with no assumptions, right? So, well, machine learning is a subfield in artificial intelligence and that uses a lot of data to infer interesting patterns about new data that you're seeing. So together, this intersection of embedded systems and machine learning, you know, it will, in this course, we unlock a whole new world uh, and that's what we introduce in this course. So, I mean, how many of you have heard like, hey Siri, okay, Google, Alexa, we probably use that multiple times, you know, in a day. And uh, if you ever wondered, you know, what happens when you speak those words, you know, how does the machine know to wake up and address you? And, you know, I speak with a different accent versus someone else. Everyone speaks with an accent, right? No matter where, where you were born or grew up with. Uh, uh, but now these machines have to be able to pick up, you know, so, so what are these specialized sensors that pick up these sounds and then continuously process them? And they're always waiting to hear these keywords. So in this class, you know, you'll not only understand how such devices work, but you'll also learn to teach these machines to respond to your own keywords. And, you know, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. So now the key difference is that while, you know, there are smart home hubs that resemble applications of tiny ML, these devices are largely plugged into the wall or they require charging. And I'm talking about putting tiny ML on tiny, tiny processors and forgetting about them. They're just battery operated and they'll operate for, you know, uh, uh, months or years. Uh, so, so here, you know, so we can sort of see like when uh, uh, one application is called a visual wake words that it, it says, when it sees you, then the system actually wakes up and then says, you know, hi to you, like that, right? So, and it recognizes whether there's an intruder or a not, not an intruder, and then it unlocks the device. So being able to do that for, you know, for audio, for detecting keywords, for video to detect person, and then for time series to sort of detect anomalies, right? So from the perspective of sensors, so in the case of uh, healthcare sensors, we have EEG sensors or the iWatch, for example, actually has anomaly detection mechanisms built into them that constantly monitor you know, our well-being. For instance, you know, does the watch know when someone has uh, fallen over? And there are detectors, and then we are looking for these anomalies to happen because these are rare events, and that sort of raises a flag and we, it informs families and so on. So, how do you detect this? You know, from you know a lot of data that's everyday data, and, and actually identify it as an anomaly. Uh, so, you're going to be looking at these time series that's you know coming in from sensors and try to understand how to process it in order to detect that something is off. Uh, and with each of these applications, we introduce new machine learning models and different machine learning models. So for example, we use uh, variational autoencoders for doing this anomaly detection. We have uh, you know, uh, different kind of convolutional networks with depth-wise and point-wise separable networks. So all of this is jargon, but I'm just saying that each application is not just about making the application. Yeah, our first goal is to make sure that you uh, become uh, very proficient in developing machine learning applications in just a weekend from after you've taken the course. And, uh, and the second thing is that you also understand machine learning and get a very good intuitive feel for what really matters so that you can shrink them down, you know, 4x, 5x and make them very energy efficient, time efficient. Uh, and you know, there's uh, no power being given to these devices from outside besides the battery. And that's the difference between applications that we are seeing today versus where machine learning is going in the future. And every student is given this kit where you have a microcontroller, you have a camera, and then you can actually do all the projects based on this kit over here, right? So, so let's talk about like, say for example, what Elon Musk is doing, right? So, so whether you love him or hate him, he's always up to something, right? So, so his startup Neuralink on the bottom right side over here has engineers, scientists that are implanting chips in the brain so they can send signals to understand brain activity. So by measuring these electrical signals that are emitted by neurons, 
we might be able to learn things about our brain. And in doing so, it can hopefully cure diseases such as, you know, uh, and treat depression, insomnia, epilepsy. And they require us to actually do this processing right there because sending those gigabits per second of data anywhere else is going to create a lot of latency, a lot of delay, and the system is not going to be responsive or even relevant enough at that point. So how are we going to achieve all of this, right? So this course has three parts. Part one is just all about understanding the language of machine learning. How do we go from explicit programming to actually a machine learning approach of doing things? And, 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 and what are the basics of that, right? So, and, and this is very much hands-on. Uh, and then we're going to learn to build useful applications in part two for you know, keyword spotting, uh, like Hey Siri, OK Google, for visual wake words, like identifying people and objects, uh, and then for time series and anomaly detection. And in part three, we're going to physically actually deploy these machine learning models that we built into these small devices uh, so that uh, you can actually gain an appreciation for, for that, right? So, uh, um, and, and, and so this way, uh, you know, but stick with me, I promise you that by the time, you know, you're done with this course, you'll actually be very proud of knowing how to program embedded microcontroller devices with machine learning capabilities. So we learn through this entire pipeline, right? So this, uh, we're not just talking about how to make a machine learning model. You have to start with capturing the sensor data, pre-processing the data, building your data sets, then constructing the neural network models and then training them. And we'll do all of this you know, using TensorFlow, which is uh, released by Google, it's a API, and that makes it easy to build machine learning applications. So then we'll convert these models from running on servers and in the cloud in, and laptops uh, into running on specific embedded hardware. And, uh, and then we will actually cover you know, the basic concepts now of designing these machine learning algorithms, but using these specific sensors now, and how do you actually then create these applications like that, right? So think about, for instance, what happens when you say, okay, Google, the first thing that happens is you know, that you have your microphone, which is a sensor, it's picking up an audio signal, which is actually an analog signal, converts it to a digital signal that can then be processed effectively with your, for your neural network. And so we have to be able to understand the sequence that we're going through, so that you know, all these nuances that you have to watch out for. So what, let's see what you will learn now right, through this. So first thing you'll learn is you know, how does this keyword spotting system actually work? And how does it actually trigger, you know, based on your voice? And then how does it then say, okay, and give you, gives you some response and, and then responds to something more complex like that, right? So this is kind of like a, a, a layered model where you go from just waking up the system and saying, okay, somebody said, hey, Siri, or okay, Google, and then wants to say, you know, uh, what's, what's the weather today? Or, you know, lower the volume with, on my earphones. Uh, so now understanding the more complex commands is that it goes and wakes up, you know, a bigger processor inside of your phone or, uh, and, and then it, then it can process, do much more, you know, language processing uh, with that, right? So we understand this entire pipeline and you actually implement this in code like that, right? So say, you know, this, what I want you to take away is that, you know, we can, we have to pre-process these signals. You're just getting an analog signal coming out of the sensors. And we, you know, we do not pick the raw data and feed it straight into the model. No, no, no. Instead, what we do is we pre-process that data. And doing this pre-processing, we're looking for critical features that we want to extract. So that it's easier for our models to be able to pick those and learn those features as we train the network. So the critical message, you know, I'm trying to convey here is that this pre-processing step is actually almost more, more important than just designing the model because we have to convert this raw signal into a different representation, you know, that we go from an audio signal and then we want to extract the frequencies. And as you see these images going down, we want to then uh, make sure that we have the important frequencies actually amplified, just like the way we hear things with our ears. And, and so we, we're not just taking the same analog signal, we're actually converting everything down. And what you see this rainbow colored figure at the bottom is uh, this heat map kind of figure is we're going to feed that frequency versus time image 
as an input now, instead of feeding an audio signal as an input. And that's this kind of conversion to the representation that a neural network can learn. And, uh, and so then, you know, why, you know, what if another question is, okay, now we are building these neural networks and we explain to you what goes on from a single neuron to multiple neurons to more complex new neural networks. We take it step by step, right? So instead of also then we say, okay, well, now if you want to build, do something more complex, you know, instead of training from scratch for all the layers, what we can do is you can take a pre-trained neural network and then do transfer learning. Uh, basically, I'm just taking the green portion of a network that is, you know, already trained on, say, a big different data set. And now I want to train it to detect instead of cars and people and cats and dogs, I want to detect like forklifts. And I want to detect things like, you know, in a warehouse, or I want to detect like, you know, uh, some, uh, some, some other things that are not part of the training set. And I can take that pre-trained network and I can add my task specific features you know, in this blue part of the network and just concatenate them. And it saves me like 99% of the time of building something from scratch. And so we'll actually look at how can you actually just mash up pre-existing, pre-trained networks that have been proven to be very capable and versatile. And then you can just add it for your own application. And, uh, <clears throat> And then we also want to look at now like things like anomaly detection that, you know, and, and as uh, most of the time you're getting data that is just normal data. And how do you see when there is a deviation from the normal? So most machine learning like that we, we study in the first part of the course is all about detecting the same pattern. Is it is a cat a cat? Over here, we are doing the opposite. We are just saying that is a fall an actual fall and it's not normal behavior. So how do we detect something that is not normal, something that rarely happens, something for which we don't have much training data? So we want to look at, well, did it fit the normal data or, or is it a large deviation from the normal data? And then we can sort of actually now treat it as an anomaly. So we have to almost like flip this machine learning structure on its, on its head uh, to detect things that are not part of the pattern. Mostly we're detecting things that are that have the same pattern, right? A cat is a cat. Here we are actually saying, well, no, a fall is not normal. How do you detect that? So we have to use what is called a variational autoencoder and that's another structure and we go through that, right? So we learn, then we have to learn to optimize for speed, for size, and then for energy so that these can just sip the energy on these microcontrollers, uh, but at the same time interact with us in real time. Say for smart glasses, if you are, say, visiting, um, you know, um, uh, another country and you have it doing, like, say, Germany, and you want to have a translation on the fly, and but it's translating everything with a three-second delay, that's going to be really difficult to listen to that person, and then three seconds later say, oh, okay, that's what you're talking about, and uh, you want that translation to happen in a real-time, interactive fashion, like that, right? So. And then the third part of this course is how about, about how we deploy all of this machine learning on actual hardware, right? So every student in the course gets this little, little kit with this microcontroller, like I showed before. And but we can't use TensorFlow, which is the you know programming language, I um, mean the API and the libraries for doing machine learning in the cloud. We have to translate this to work on any hardware platform. And so we have to use TensorFlow Lite Micro. So TensorFlow is great for the cloud. TensorFlow Lite is great for like mobile phones uh, and with, you know, like Raspberry Pi or which have like a, you know, an operating system on it. And then TensorFlow Lite basically takes your model and just translates it into a binary. And then we can just dump that binary onto this microcontroller and say run and based on the sensor inputs, it will actually start listening to the microphone or to the inertial measurement unit or different sensors and then output the signals very effectively. And so the goal of this course is actually to walk through the entire life cycle of machine learning. It's not just about saying, here's some cookie cutter models to make and now go ahead and conquer the universe. Uh, it's really about building your own data sets, converting those data sets, pre-processing them, and then figuring out the entire pipeline. 
And this is also like an iterative process because you have to figure out the right model, you have to figure out the right ways to evaluate the model. And once you deploy it, you want to make sure that you know that your model is actually working for the data that it's getting, you know, and there's no bias and there's and, and its accuracy in the field is also good. And then how do you then update your model and your data sets and keep going through this? So it's really an, a full engineering approach and a very practical approach to learning machine learning. So in the first part of the course, we learn these fundamentals of tiny machine learning. How do neural networks work? How can you build them? And we'll understand you know, machine learning, pro the programming paradigm where we train the machine to figure out and find and learn patterns and data. And then we use it to solve very simple problem like regression to computer vision. And so by in the first, by the end of first week, we you've done it for you know detecting you know different images and 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 building uh, and and using large data sets and training across that. And every module has a responsible AI you know uh, 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 lecture as part of it. There are three modules, so we have three of these lectures because we have to be very careful that we have the right framework for responsible AI, for the ethical aspects uh, as we build these systems. Uh, then the, the course is structured to give you like this overview, but then you'll develop to understand, uh, you know, these and build these applications for keyword spotting, uh, for sound recognition, such as, you know, breaking glass or anomalies. And then, uh, and then you uh, also to uh, detect objects like that, right? So you learn these skills, developing data sets, deep neural network models, convolutional neural network models, and then how to deploy these applications uh, in these systems. And then this is not, you know, uh, this, what this course is not about is not about machine learning theory or the math behind it. It's really about bringing, giving you the intuition for machine learning and giving you the actual skills to build machine learning applications. Uh, but since we are focusing on shrinking the models, we really get a very good insight into uh, what, what is the sensitivity of what, what really makes this machine learning model tick. And, and then you can go in and say, if you want to understand the math behind it, take a graduate level machine learning course. Uh, and with this kit, you have these sensors and a microcontroller, and then we do all these coding assignments and they're done in Google Colab. That means you can just do all the assignments, you know, in your browser and you don't have to learn any other tools. And then you can even directly program these robots to actually now navigate. And, uh, and so, uh, so that's sort of a, a summary and how it's structured is essentially, you know, we learn through both offline and online lectures. For you at CMU, I'll release this after this point, I'll release the entire, the whole course is uh, available online and you can do all the assignments, watch all the videos and the lectures are made to be interesting and entertaining um, and, 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 and they are just snippets, right? And then there are very good tutorials along with that, right? So. So the collabs provide you know, like uh, hands-on learning with the code in the cloud using Google's code laboratory environment. And uh, we all we host all these assignments, you know, then you don't have to have a powerful laptop or, you know, to run any of this stuff. The assignments, they will challenge you uh, with all that you have learned in these, you know, and in the tutorials. And then you apply to solve these practical problems, you know, with hands-on tasks. And, uh, and and then we have over eight assignments and over 27 tutorials. And then there are quizzes. Uh, there are no major exams, but there are five quizzes that just act as knowledge checks that are sprinkled, you know, and they're short quizzes. And then we also have a lot of lecture notes uh, that are available for everyone to use like that, right? So, and, so together with all of these approaches, you can have different ways to learn uh, this, right? And most importantly, these tutorials are very much in the core, in the, they bring you, introduce you to the code in a gentle way and take you through building these models many times. And so you get that familiarity, you get that, you know, hand-eye coordination as we work through that. And, uh, and, and everything here is, is easy to run on this hardware. And, you know, these are kind of examples of the reading content and the installation uh, uh, tutorials that are there, right? So uh, as we go through different parts and, uh, so while this, you know, uh, from, from this course, we also want to make sure that, you know, we are actually 
understanding the benefits, obviously, of machine learning, but we also want to understand that there are this carries great risks for individuals who are contributing their data. Uh, so perhaps unsurprisingly, then, you know, there are emerging laws and regulations surrounding data collection and use. And so we ask all these questions in each of the modules of the courses for responsible AI. And we actually look at case studies at the end of each module. <coughs> and so, so this is just a co the mechanisms of the course. And, you know, you don't have to worry about getting grades over here. But it's easy to be for this course to also be taught in CMU. And, you know, if you're wondering, like, what prerequisites, you just need basic scripting in Python, not, not anything fancy. And very little exposure, really, to any working on any hardware, because we'll, we'll walk you through that through the course. Will this course be hard? Yes and no. Yes, because the material is actually hands-on. And no, it won't take more than 10 hours a week. It's not meant to be a stressful course. And actually, together with me, uh, these uh, two uh, uh, assistants helped co-develop this course. But we also are very thankful to the teams from Google and Harvard who prepared the initial version of these courses. They were, it was a very light and easy course. And then we made it a little bit more challenging and interesting and deeper in that sense. So, so obviously, uh, you know, I, I, I teach this course. But in addition to this course, we also teach like, you know, uh, autonomous uh, self-driving racing cars and, and how do you do perception planning and control and overall like you know from this teaching of uh, you know building safe autonomous systems is our general theme uh, but it's with you know me implantable medical devices so they are also autonomous systems like pacemakers defibrillators that are implanted in your body and you want to make sure that the software in them should shock you only when they should and should not when they should not and vice versa. And uh, and so uh, by focusing on building like, you know, safety critical and life critical applications uh, and the tools for making sure that, you know, there are good mathematical models and principles for that, uh, we, are, we are very excited to introduce and bring to you tiny machine learning. And the main reason I think that, you know, the future of machine learning is tiny and bright is because today machine learning only, you know, uses about 1% of the overall data that is available from all the sensors that is there. And tiny machine learning by doing machine learning right at the edge gives us access to this 99% of the data that is there. And that's over like, you know, 100 uh, billion uh, uh, pentabytes of data that's being generated. Uh, so, you know, who knows, you know, after, by, by taking this course, you might very well be building the next major industry based on TinyML. And I'd be very happy to help anyone who is interested in this and get started with uh, tiny machine learning. Yeah, so I'll stop over here. Or I'll be happy to take any questions. Yeah, hi, Rahul. This is Nick Martellero from the HCI here at CMU. Um, this is really cool. This is a super great um, resource. I'm curious, are there any parts of the course where students go out to uh, collect data um, from a sensor and then, um, you know, sort of work with their own thing, like, the, like, in their, like take something for their own project um, and uh, their own data and then retrain that, uh, I guess, on the cloud and then download the model? Yeah, yeah, actually, definitely. I'm, uh, one thing I forgot to mention is that <clears throat> all the students, uh, they, they all do a month long uh, presentation uh, uh, project where they have to actually do exactly that. Oh, cool. like, so, uh, so let me see, I, I, I haven't uh, played this presentation before, but I'll, I'll try to uh, just, so like, you know, the one, one of the students did it for, uh, uh, <clears throat> In, in this case, let me just see what is this. Oh. Student had, had done, uh, uh, like uh, they wanted to detect when their FedEx or you put Amazon packages come down to them. And so they put this camera based system outside their window and they're just detecting whether the truck came or no truck like that, right? And as mm -hmm. the truck 
comes it detects but they had to make their own like they cal- they collected over i think like uh, 20000 images uh, from outside their window of uh, whether the truck is there or not and then oh. got it actually automatically labeled uh, and uh, was able to detect that right so i mean yeah the other one was you know uh detecting uh potholes and so they had this uh robot actually go over potholes and 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 do uh, uh that so they had to build their own data set for for going over bumps and 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 going over potholes and detecting that like now this might seem obviously very simple and trivial uh i mean and and it is but the point is that they had to build their own data set they had to go through the entire a uh, system you know uh, from s- s- literally from scratch to detect that right so uh, then there were more interesting you know ones of uh, where they had the gesture controlled uh, and voice controlled movements of this robot and uh, and and as they could make it you know move around uh, take a left turn or a right turn and and so so this is all like you know the small building blocks of building these uh, uh, these uh, uh, applications and then we can obviously get to more uh, you know and then this is with a voice control uh, go stop yeah it's not always responsive so stop yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, it, and it is and it can get very frustrating when they are building these uh, applications uh so so then the the this was another one he wanted to do like handwriting to latex so just converting it into a digitized way and solving these things so this was an amazing thing that he would just write everything down in, in on his scratch pad and then it would actually go and generate the output and it would actually calculate you know the the output like that right so uh but this is a the students idea they built their own data sets so and then they built their own kind of applications and uh, uh so uh, and their own app also on the phone like that right so uh, like what is a plus b and then it could uh, it could actually then do that recognition uh this one was a fun one where they wanted to do like black jack card counter so uh, and, and then as they go on uh, you know so uh, uh just just showing different cards that are there like so they had to build that data set and and then so you know in my opinion a lot of these are frivolous right that right so because we we like to work but there was other application there were other applications where they were looking at uh, like a paramedic trying to put a needle in the uh, in the ambulatory sort of uh, situation and so they were detecting like the veins and and figuring out like a a mask for the veins and so they could guide the needle over there and and this semester some are like actually looking at uh, interpreting the dance of the bees i mean there are so many student uh, applications like that right so yeah but uh, but i think that this is just the beginning we only offer it for one semester and this is the second semester i'd love to have hci use this in every different way and there's so much we can do so it's 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 just the beginning of what we can I'd be more than happy to discuss that with you yeah very cool thank you very much thanks for sharing it down so yeah so i think there was some questions online you know how do you see the field of machine learning evolving over the next 5 to 10 years i wish i could tell you the answer <laughs> it is evolving at such an insane speed uh but i i think like i'll just give my answer from this perspective of you know getting machine learning to the edge right i mean machine learning is doing many different things uh and and you know i think it's also like a tension for for faculty uh that you know students want to they come into the lab and they say hey i want to work on reinforcement learning for this or reinforcement learning for that and my first response is always like can you solve the problem without machine learning and most of the time they say no i don't know what the problem really is and then so then we have to go through this process of saying okay can you first solve the problem on your own using first principles first you learn to solve the problem then you can help the machine learn to solve the problem but i think that's just part of us you know uh, kind of trying to figure out how machine learning can and when it can be useful it's not just a big hammer uh 
So I think it's definitely going to transform the way, like, you know, um, with all this chat GPT, stable diffusion, obviously you've seen tons of those examples. So I have like two points to make here, right? One point is that, you know, as we're going to the edge, how do we really make these machine learning models that efficient to do some non-trivial things? These demos I showed you are kind of trivial like that, right? But they are, they are what student, a student can do in like literally one week on their own like that, right? I mean, the project is over three weeks, but we all know most people, most of us just do the project in the two days before the project. So I've had my fair share of all-nighters when I was an undergrad in CMU. Um, so the so the question is that you really need to understand the principles, like the real deep principles of machine learning to be able to shrink these models down uh, because you want to compress them to uh, almost like get to 90% like smaller size models, but with only maybe, you know, 0.5% loss in accuracy, for example. So how do you achieve that? I think that's one of the questions that you can hopefully get some insight uh, with, with, with this course. The second part I think is much more to do with the ethical aspects, you know, and I think we don't like, at least at Penn, you know, and, and, I, and I know the engineering side in CMU, this uh, most students, if you ask them, okay, we have self-driving cars and Elon Musk, you know, has a, semi-working autonomous driving system. And, um, but eventually, you know, if it works well, it will save a lot of lives, but is it okay to kill a few people to improve the system? And I would say like 90% of the class will be like, yeah, it's okay because, you know, technology first. And then I say, what well, is it okay if it was like your younger brother, or younger sister, and then, you know, all but maybe two hands will go down. I don't know why, but, <laughs> but, the point is that whenever there is a problem now with anything like Volkswagen had this recall or Boeing had this recall at the, in the Volkswagen case where they did this cheating with the emissions, uh, the, it all bought, it was over 110 million cars were, you know, basically reporting fake data for emissions. In the end, they just like basically go and uh, arrest a second level software developer in the company. Now, is that second level software developer really responsible and there was no oversight and they deployed it over 110 million cars? No, so, so from a perspective of like, you know, uh, a student, it's really important to have the framework for ethical design of these machine learning systems and to know, you know, where does responsibility lie? What kind of liabilities are there? And, and what are these ethical boundaries that we're talking about, right? So. And, and so I think that is really important. I'm sure that technology is going to be like, you know, 100x more powerful in 10 years. Um, so, so I think, yeah, the students interested in this course was the biggest obstacles. I don't think this course is meant to be available and accessible for any student like that, right? It, it does not require crazy math knowledge. A freshman, undergrad freshman should be able to take it. I even have biomedical engineers take it, mechanical engineers. So it's basically uh, all sorts of people, all sorts of backgrounds. And then even PSE students who work in like, you know, uh, nuclear physics, they want to take this course to help with you know, detection or, or designing antennas like that, right? So yeah, and I think Stan has his hand up. Thank you for doing the presentation, Rahul. That was uh, really helpful. Um, one question just off of your last comments um, about the diversity of students. Um, would this be appropriate for community college uh, courses or um, possibly even into STEM, you know, type, high school type STEM, STEM courses like, you know, Rural Robotics Initiative and some of our other partners? What do you think about community college or rural robotics? Could it be tailored for them? Yeah, yeah, it's hundred percent. I I think the the course is very approachable, and and you know for for people who have some background, they can skip ahead. But uh, the the way even in which the tutorials build up is really saying, okay, we just have one neuron, and we just have a very simple problem. How do we solve it? Then we go to two neurons, and then we go to like you know two layers of neurons, and then we gradually build it up to then convolutional neural networks, but we understand the principles of that. And then it goes bigger and bigger. 
but it does not go like to very, very advanced concepts. And it's not going also necessarily very, very deep in the math of any of these concepts, but it's giving you an idea uh, of, and it's giving you much more the intuition. Right? And I think, uh, so one ironic thing that, you know, Stan, you're talking about people from, you know, uh, like say even like high school students can totally take this course. You don't, you just need a Chromebook, not even like a MacBook or an expensive laptop because it all runs in the browser. And uh, the kit costs just $25 and it's just manufactured, you know, uh, open source uh, for, for this and it's available, you know, online. And uh, the, the other ironic thing is that I actually found some students who had taken the grad level machine learning course come and take this course. And to me, that was like really weird. I was like, you already know this, but they were like, yeah, we didn't learn that much about, you know, actually building and using machine learning models. We just learned about the, the principles under the hood. And, uh, and then, so this gives a, uh, a very easy way to start using TensorFlow and then to run it on your cell phone, to run it on all of these platforms. And, uh, and I'll share with uh, Joy and Stan uh, the links to this course and it's all actually just tinyml.cs.upen.edu, but all the material is available for free. And like I mentioned, there are over 90 uh, lecture snippets that I recorded uh, that anyone can watch and paste it along the way. And uh, currently many high school students are actually doing this course uh, across the world. Uh, and uh, so that's my kind of pilot to see how well they actually do that. So we are definitely investigating that. And I'd love to discuss it with the Mobility 21, uh, you know, community colleges that work with us uh, to uh, have it there. Uh, Thank you, Raul. That's a great, great resource. Thanks for all your effort. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, hi, Professor. I'm Chelsea from Master of Information System Management program. Previously, I have some experience with machine learning and AI, uh, but the hardware and embedded software part is quite new to me. Uh, do you mind introduce more about uh, when do we get hands on in this course with more of the embedded part or the actual hardware part? And what are some approaches that we use in this course? learning that yeah yeah that's a great question just so so the first thing is that we we introduce the hardware in the third part of the course okay so uh, uh and and i'll just uh, also just share these slides with you uh and uh, uh so so that you have access to it and uh so uh you know just and so in the third part of the course uh uh, we we basically have a way to uh, we, we we give the students the kits and then you are essentially just directly programming uh, the microcontroller or robots from your laptop. But what is happening is that you're 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 taking your model that you've generated. Say you have like some CNN based model and you've trained it, and then using TensorFlow Lite, it is only extracting that model and the bytes of that model. And 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 then you're you're and it's dumping those bytes in a file, and then essentially you just have only the the model to be executed directly on the hardware, and you're just loading that onto the hardware, and it works uh, flawlessly across many different hardware platforms. And I also want to note that all of this work of like pruning and shrinking and uh, 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 compressing quantization of these models. Uh, it's all very recent, like from 2017 to 2019. And uh, it's very available. Even TensorFlow Lite Micro is, is just about two years old. And now the course makes it very accessible. You can go in terms of the hardware, you can just run the program directly and you don't have to know circuits or any details. And then you can put it on this kind of robot platform that we have and the tutorials walk you through step-by-step step we assume no knowledge about ever have worked with any hardware and uh, and there are lots of uh, FAQs along the way. And uh, in fact, uh, even uh, one of the, uh, the, the, the other projects that we have is, uh, uh, is, is called F110. And 
and you can I'll put that in in the chat for uh, and 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 then that's a, another kind of project where we have made you know this kind of technology very accessible and uh, and and available and uh, and that's sort of uh, what you can uh, that's the kind of guiding principle that we have so that you can see that right and that's how to build like put all of the smarts for perception planning control in in these racing vehicles and so the site has a build thing they give you all the directions on how to build the car and 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 you know goes to the details of uh, you know even to simulate it uh, and actually to build the hardware there are lectures on how to learn everything so say you're learning different uh, topics and uh, and um, uh, and and so there are videos for all of that and the lectures and then we have competitions you know for uh, this right so our, our whole goal is that any kind of course material that we make we make it very available and accessible we don't need any hardware knowledge uh, to begin with yeah. thank you so much for the resources yeah thank you great questions and if you have any questions just uh, feel free to reach out to me Anything else? Okay, well, thank you, Rahul, for sharing your work. And to all of today's attendees, thank you for joining us. As I mentioned earlier, today's presentation will be posted on the Mobility 21 What's Happening page of the website, along with a link to the video of the session. This afternoon, you'll receiving, you will be receiving an email asking you to take a short survey about today's SMC, so please take a few minutes to provide your feedback. For students who are interested in engaging in transportation topics, the Transportation Club on campus is a great way to plug into transportation topics with fellow transportation nerds. And our next SMC will be on Friday, February 24th, and will feature Umit Osgunar and Bilal Hijaz of the Ohio State University. So watch for your invitation to join us closer to that date. Again, thank you for attending today, and please feel free to contact us with any questions. Thank you. Thank you.